I love. It may be unusual for me to sit when I'm teaching. I'm doing so this morning. Some of you know I've actually been out of the, in and out of the hospital, PR, several times for the past two weeks. And I'm still in recovery. So I'm trying to take it easy. And it's poignant because, and in fact almost a life lesson, because we're here to celebrate the kingship of Jesus. And a part of what it means to live as a subject is to acknowledge and to be okay with the sovereign's decisions in your life. And my sovereign's decision about my life is that my recovery will go slowly. <laughs> and therefore, I have to be okay with that. No matter what that says about my schedule and the kinds of things I would like to do, including standing and preaching. If you've seen me before, as most of you have, I, I walk and wander. Uh, I'm, I can't do that this morning. But it, it's a life lesson because, you see, to understand that Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I wasn't being facetious at the beginning of the service when I said, and that means I'm not, I'm not king, I'm not Lord. And in fact, I'm invited into a different kind of reality. I'm, I'm reading a series of historic mystery novels that feature a, an attorney who is serving as a lawyer in London during the time of the English Reformation under Tudor England. And one of the things that is eye-opening for me is the tremendous power, authority, and fear with which the King of England and all sovereigns were, are in fact held. There's this scene in one of the novels when Henry VIII appears with this enormous entourage. We're talking thousands of people who enter into the village of York and for these people, it is a once-in-a-lifetime experience just to behold the king. That is something they will tell their grandchildren, and it will be passed down from generations. And the protagonist of this novel, Matthew Chardonnay, literally is called forward because he has a royal obligation. And after it's over, everyone is stunned that the king spoke to you. We don't think about Barack Obama that way. <laughs> or anybody in the presidency. I mean, they thought of kings as literally a different order of human being. Now, obviously for us that's adult. But the fact of the matter is, is that I am learning from that in the way I'm invited to acknowledge Jesus as my king. Because if you're the subject of a king, you do whatever the king asks. And in fact, it's considered a privilege to be able to be obedient to your king. Anything other than that is actually subversive. And under most of the Tudor, Tudor kings, if you were doing what you wanted to do in disobedience to the will of the king, you, it was not good for you. <laughs> he had absolute authority over life and death. And you could be literally beheaded in a moment. The good news is that our king does not behead in a moment. But it's also fair to say that for the writers of the New Testament, for Jesus to be called the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords has a level of authority about it that you and I as Latitudinarian Americans don't always appreciate. We, we see one another, regardless of his or her station, as not of us, unless it's a boss to whom we must do what needs to be done. But it's not a different order of human being. But when we're invited to think of Jesus as king, that means instantaneous acknowledgement that he is, in fact, over all. 
what we like and what we don't like, and that our, in essence, only job is to be subservient, a word we Americans can't stand, subservient to the authority of that king and seek out how we might please him. That we, because we have the privilege to do so, are invited, commanded to do his bidding. Only a king would say to his followers, as Jesus said to his disciples, if you love me, you will keep my commands. That's a very royal thing to say. That's not the word from a rabbi. That's the word of a king. Kingship is concentrated in front of us in the gospel. It really is a kind of con confrontation between powers. Jesus has been arrested. Jesus has been brought before the Sanhedrin. They don't want to kill him because they can't. And therefore, they're turning him over to Pilate because Pilate, as the emissary of Caesar, is the one who has ultimate powers of life and death. And like the sovereign he represents, that power is instantaneous. It is based on his command. So Pilate is the one who, in fact, holds the key in the Gospel of John as to whether or not Jesus will be executed or not. Everybody else takes a back seat to this one central encounter, which we read in detail on Good Friday during the noon service. But we have here, because of the, ex because of the explanation of who he is, Pilate knows that they want this man executed. Otherwise, the chief priest of the Sanhedrin, as Pilate says, the nation of Israel has presented you to me. They, he knows they want him dead. But you see, Pilate is used to the pomp of Caesar. So how is it that this carpenter, who was arrested without any struggle whatsoever, except remember Peter cutting off the ear of one of the high priest's servants, that Jesus healed instantaneously. That, that's, not, that's not how a rebel guilty of sedition operates. He readily yields to being arrested. He is taken in, and as it says in Isaiah, he speaks not a word like a sheep before his shearers is mute. And so, Pilate's ready. It doesn't make sense to him, so he wants to get down to business. He's, he's a no-nonsense leader. And so it, this is where the gospel picks up. Then Pilate enters the headquarters, meaning the place where you can imagine soldiers and all standing, as it were, at some great respectful distance. Nobody gets close to Pilate. And he summons Jesus. See, he's the power guy in the room. At least that's what he thinks. And he asked straight up, are you king of the Jews? Jesus, notice, is fearless in his response. Most, if not all, who were brought before Pilate would be terrified. Because they could be, at this command, tortured, executed. You don't really know what it's like to face the possibility of torture until it's right in front of you. You don't really know entirely how you will act. But Jesus literally speaks to him as an eagle, which I'm sure is astonished for Pilate. And he answers in a way that is subtle. He's trying to get at whether Pilate is asking him as a personal question, it's wondrous. You see, even in this situation, Jesus is actually concerned about Pilate's eternal destiny. He's there to, he's there to look at this, can you imagine? He's not there to save his life. And so the question he asks is, are you, do you ask this on your own? Or have others told this about you? In other words, are you actually personally interested in the question? Or are you instead just functioning as a prosecutor trying to carry out information? And 
pilot is highly offended. He is not used to being talked to like this. Look straight in the eye, speak person to person, equal to equal. So Pilate is offended. Am I a Jew? He says, and you can hear the racist disdain in his voice. He said, your own nation, the chief priests, have handed you over to me. In other words, there is no higher authority in Israel except for me, Pilate has said. And therefore, if they have handed you over to me, don't play the innocent Jesus. And so he says, what have you done? Jesus still does not answer the question directly. Instead, he uses it again as an opportunity to talk about who he is. So he says, my kingdom is not from this world. Meaning, my kingdom is above yours. That's really what he's saying. In other words, there is an eternal character. It comes from God. It's going in and through this world to God. You're the temporal authority here. <laughs> Which, of course, for Pilate is again in the front because Caesar was thought as divine. And he says, and here's the distinction. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers, in other words, would be acting just like yours. They would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. You see, Jesus is saying something very clear, that the nature of his kingdom is eternal, so that we serve and operate and act in a different manner than those who are interested in preserving the present social order. And in fact, we understand that to call Jesus as King of all kings and Lord of all lords is the overthrow of the present social order. Even those social orders that we think to be good, they're all passing away. We choose as Americans to function in a democracy because we feel like that's the best of all evils in terms of government. But the fact of the matter is, is that all forms of government are passing away. All business enterprises that operate in, as their own fiefdoms are passing away. Every single bit of political and social and cultural order that you and I know and may or may not be comfortable with. Because each social order, no matter how good it is, has victors and victims. All. None are immune. And because that is the case, they're broken. We live with the fact that in this world you will have tribulation, that Jesus said. Jesus said. Why? Because we're actually called to craft and think about our life as ones who serve a sovereign who is above all the other social orders, political and the like, that are commanding and asking for our allegiance. We take nothing for granted in that sense. So that no matter what is asked of us, the question inside always becomes, will this serve my people? Most of us actually do not think about our normal life from that perspective. We live quite comfortably, many of us, as members of 21st century America, here in Central Florida. And yet there are profound places about our life that are in fact direct, in direct conflict with what it means to serve the King of all kings and the Lord of all rulers. You see, this as is called Christ the King Sunday is meant to both sum up the very nature of the gospel and set the stage for us as we enter into Advent, starting next Sunday, which is a time of penitence, a time of self-examination, because it is under the authority of King Jesus that we are invited in Advent to say, how is my life not and is like what it means to serve Jesus as King of all kings? Where do I compromise with my culture? God, what are you doing in calling me to change 
And Advent is that time when it is in fact the most countercultural thing. To take a season that is set aside for festivity and use it as a time for self-examination and repentance. It is meant to feel at odds. It is meant to. And the reason it is is because, in essence, what the liturgical calendar is saying, well, sisters and brothers get used to it. This is what it means to be a Christian. We're always going to feel at odds in some way or another. <laughs> it's, just, it's just how it is. And so, when he says, if my followers were in your kingdom, they would have taken up arms and fought to keep me from the Jews. But my followers don't act like that. That's really what he said. He said that as it is, my kingdom is not, is not from here. In other words, it, it isn't connected to you, Pilate. You're not a part of this. So Pilate responds. He's trying to re-get the conversation back on his track rather than on Jesus' track. So you are a king. And then it closes. You say that I am a king. In other words, he's trying to make the distinction because his kingdom is based on a different order. He is not, you see, Henry VIII, who, who we cower in his presence. His kingdom is based upon loving submission. The kingdoms of this world enforce their kingdom by outward law and coercion. That's the nature of the society in which we live. We gladly submit ourselves to those laws because we understand that's best for the order of our society, but punishment, at least if we're functioning properly, operates swiftly if someone breaks those laws because it is that coercion that helps keep us rebellious human beings in line. The kingdom of God, however, operates entirely differently. The kingdom of God is not based on outward coercion. The kingdom of God and obedience to it is based on a transformed heart. It's not coercion from the outside. It's transformation from the inside that invites us not to be warriors in the traditional sense, but to be servants. That's the mark of acknowledging Jesus as a king. And that is not of this world. So at one level, yes, he says, you say that I am because I'm not the kind of king that you are thinking about. I'm not a political ruler who will exact vengeance on his enemies in this life. Instead, I am a sovereign that calls people to come and receive and be changed and to live a life based on servanthood, not mastery, <coughs> which is the mark of these kingdoms. And here is the kicker. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. That causes me to tremble. And the reason it does is because what he's saying is, is that his way, a way of serving and being transformed, is in fact the way of truth. Remember, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And that to follow a sovereign that is based on coercion, retribution, and power. It's manifested as self-mastery, success, and ascension in this life is in fact based on a profound lie. It is not of the truth. Because to be of the truth is to choose to serve. It is to choose to take the lowest place. It is to choose to love even in the face of opposition. It is to choose to give even when you feel as if you have nothing to give. It is exactly the opposite of mastery. It is in fact the way of self-denial because that is what we're invited to because we serve this king who, as it says in Philippians, 
did not think equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. That's how kingship operates in this kingdom. So family, my sisters and brothers, it's more than just saying, yeah, you're the Lord and I'm not, and then going out and doing whatever the heck I want to do. <laughs> I, read, I saw a quote on Twitter, and it was from Bob Dylan, of all people, who, who said, we rarely obey. Instead, we do whatever's convenient, and then we're after. Mm -hmm. I would call you as your bishop, as well as your sister, as your brother in Christ, to think about Advent differently this week, and to meditate on what it means to follow a king who opposes many of our ideas and who invites us into a place of service for the sake of his kingdom, which will never pass away. Let us pray to Gracious Lord, who is the King of all kings, we do confess to you that our life almost always looks more like self-mastery than it does submission. Of wanting our own way rather than yielding to your authority as our sovereign. And Lord, we don't know how to do anything else. You need to come and show us what it means to yield. And in so doing, be a channel for your kingdom to flow both in us and through us. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen.